Let me introduce the last speaker for the computer vision session, uh, Jose Alvarez. Uh, he's senior researcher scientist at NVIDIA, and he works on deep learning and computer vision for autonomous driving. So he did the PhD in computer science at Universidad Autónoma Barcelona and the degree in telecommunication engineering in La Salle, Barcelona. Thank you. Let's try. Well, thanks. Um, so what I'm going to do today um, is going to talk about the work we are doing at, uh, at NVIDIA. In particular, I'm in the um, AI Infra team, which is a kind of interesting name for the team. And the main goal at this team is um, to do an industry-grade deep learning to take autonomous vehicle and deep learning for autonomous vehicles into production. And that's quite similar or quite related to what um, has been um, presented before, right? And in particular, I want to talk about how this needs to be robust to be tested in different conditions, different weather, different uh, kind of situations. And for us, the main challenge here is going to be uh, the scale of this problem. So let me talk about this. First of all, what does perception for autonomous driving mean? Um, I'm sure you're quite aware of this type of uh, results where you can do object detection, distance detection, um, semantic segmentation. This was part of my PhD thesis. It was uh, quite boring at that time, and now it's uh, more interesting. Um, in any case, when we think about all these uh, in the individual systems um, separately, what we have in mind probably is something like this, right? So you have a, a vehicle, you go out there, you collect some images, you generate a data set in a way or another, you manage to uh, label a few images, um, and then you train and test uh, um, a deep learning model that is going to be placed again in the, in the vehicle and is going to um, uh, do some, some inference or ideally some autonomous driving. Um, what we are talking here is about industry grade. And for us, that means that we really need high quality system and we need to reduce the number of failures close to zero. And we need to make sure that, that those, those, those uh, failures are really um, zero. That means that you have to test in a large amount of data. And interestingly, many people is focusing on how do you in increase the training set. For us, it's going to be extremely important how do you really test and really warranty that uh, your system will never fail or hardly ever fail, right? So the system before was about going out there with one single vehicle collecting some images. But what is happening at, at, at this time is that we don't have a, a single um, vehicle. What we have is a, a, a bunch of vehicles, and every company has a bunch of vehicles. So data is not a problem anymore. We are actually collecting way more data than what we need, right? And it's kind of obvious that we cannot really label everything. We are going to be able to only um, label a small portion of this. Even at NVIDIA, even with mechanical torque, even having uh, plenty of people labeling data, it's not possible to label everything. Therefore, what we have to do is we need to modify the previous pipeline, and probably what we have to do is, is be smart in, in cherry picking the data that we are getting into the labeling process, and that data is going to be fit into the training. In addition, if we manage to scale and we manage to, to do a, a huge effort in labeling all this data, what is going to happen is that training those models is going to be quite difficult. At the moment, um, there's, a, there's a need for compute power. Um, even at NVIDIA, we still have some issues for, for training all these models that require a longer and longer time. Therefore, we again need to modify the pipeline and we're going to try to make models and systems that are way more efficient, especially if we want to test at the scale. We, we want to do inference as fast as possible to make sure that we can see as many data as possible. And last but not least, 
um, we are talking about reducing the number of failures, so we need to make sure that our model can be tested all over the world. In our case, we are collecting data in, the, um, in California, but ideally you want that, that model to perform whatever in the world you are, right? And for us, robustness is not only about weather conditions, uh, daytime, or uh, location in the world. You need to also think about um, safety, safety in front of us, cyber attacks, which is quite a, a huge trend at the moment. But also, if you think of autonomous driving, what happens if your sensor fails? You need to make sure that your system is aware and is agnostic to that type of failures. Not, not just the, the complete image goes black, but what happens if you have some kind of salt and pepper noise or noisier images than those that you had when you were collecting the data? Therefore, we also have to modify our models to make sure that uh, there's some robustness there, right? So what I'm going to do in the next, next uh, hopefully, seven minutes, um, let's see, uh, I'm going to try to briefly talk about our efforts at the team in terms of active learning, how to cherry pick the data, in uh, efficient deep learning and domain adaptation. And I'm going to mix the, what we have been doing there and some other works that uh, I've been involved in the past. So first of all, um, what about active learning? So as I said, uh, it's quite unlikely that we manage to label everything, every single data that we uh, collect, right? So it's very important that we manage to, among a, a bunch of unlabeled data, we manage to find those that are extremely interesting for the, for the model. So if you think of, of driving scenes, probably this comes to your mind or, or any kind of uh, highway uh, data comes to your mind. But it's not really useful to have 100 or thousands of images like this one. What would be interesting is to find this other one in the data set, right? And to make sure that your model is still able to infer something or at least to say, look, there's something wrong here, I don't understand, rather than um, send some other um, outcome. So what active learning aims at is trying to close the loop. This is the, the common pipeline where you have some, you collect some data, you put some labelers, you generate a labeled data set, you train a model, and you do inference. What would be interesting, interesting is to use the model that you just trained to analyze the unlabeled data and go back and, and, and select what data the labelers need to annotate. So in our particular case, we're going to do this through a model on uncertainty. If we manage to understand where the model is certain and where it's not, we should be able to, um, to, to send the uncertain data to the labelers and just uh, label those points and introduce those into the uh, training set. So the, the, the principal approach to this, a uh, really um, good approach to this mathematically sounded, is through Bayesian uh, neural networks. However, um, training those networks is not easy not even with all the uh, DGXs that we have there. It's quite uh, painful. And importantly, when you do testing, um, what you have to do is sample multiple times per, per image, and that becomes quite untractable as well, right? So a, a common approach to do this is instead of doing Bayesian neural networks, what people have been doing in the past is I'm going to train an ensemble of different models and at inference time, if the models agree, that means that probably that, that new sample is a known sample, and if the models disagree, probably means that, that the, sum, the, um, the models don't, don't understand what is there, so you probably should label that model. The problem of this approach is that when you train this, this model separately, there's no uh, connection between the parameters of um, one model and the other contrary to Bayesian deep learning, where what you're trying to do is, instead of um, learning a single value per, per parameter, you're trying to learn a uh, distribution for every parameter in the network. In this case, you just train a bunch of networks where the first, uh, let's say, kernel of the first network does not interact with the first kernel of the second network. So there's no coherence at there. What we have been working on is can we mix the best of both worlds? Can we do some type of Bayesian where the first kernel does interact with the first kernel of the second 
network and at the same time is fast enough and, and, and is possible to train this. So we have uh, proposed uh, um, what we call deep probabilistic ensembles and the idea is just rigorize when you train an ensemble as a whole, a joint training of, the, of the, all the models of the ensemble, try to rigorize to make sure that the kernels do form a, a distribution of probabilities. And then given this, um, you run the, run the inference over a single um, sample and it's going to give you the uncertainty and if it's uh, high and uncertain, you will label this and if it's certain, you will not label this point. So what we did is we have been running some experiments on uh, classification. I'm going to show you some experiments on classification. We have some more on segmentation. Um, the idea is what happens if we get a classification data set and instead of training with all the images, we just collect a few of them, train the model with a few of them, and then in increase uh, the number of images that we are using. As a baseline or a, as, a, uh, as an upper bound, we're going to use uh, training with all the images. And this is what we get in all particular case with a type of ResNet 18, uh, um, around 95% accuracy. If we start with 4,000 images and ra we randomly increase the number of, of images in the 2,000 every time, this is the trend that we get. The more images, the better accuracy. And ideally, this should converge to the, uh, to the upper bound. If we use our approach, what we get is that quickly we go faster to, to, to get closer to the upper bound. So somehow we see that we could get quite competitive results in terms of, of um, overall accuracy only, only using one fourth of the data, which is quite promising. Right? If we compare this to some other state of the art, here you have some, some in, the, in the first two rows, some um, existing methods, and in the last row, what we can get um, in this CIFAR 10 again. And as I said, um, the, in the paper and in a new submission, we have some other results for semantic segmentation, which are quite promising, right? So let me very briefly talk about some other efforts that we have been doing on the, on the idea of, of um, efficiency. Keep in mind that now we have a method that is able to go through all these unlabeled data and, and you can collect um, interesting samples and put that into the labelers and just increase your data set uh, to, to, until the end, right? Now, how do you train that? What you need to do is, is make sure that you, you manage to get something that is efficient enough. And for us, or at least for me, the ideal goal would be um, maximize the resources that you have for, for training and then make sure that it still runs on the uh, on, on efficient, uh, on embedded devices, right? So this is what we have uh, usually in mind. You train a model, whatever model that you, uh, architecture that you have, and you do some efforts for proning optimizing, and then you try to optimize again for the specific hardware where you're going to deploy this. Um, an interesting thing is we usually just cherry pick the, uh, the architecture from someone else, but it would be nice to, to try to select how many neurons you have in every layer, right? So the common approach for a pruning is just uh, you have a, a kernel and you're going to introduce some uh, weight decay L1 uh, regularization. What we have done is instead of considering each parameter independently, we could consider the structure of the network and regularize as a group. And on top of that, we thought, well, there's some correlation between the kernels so if we manage to, if we manage to make sure that um, the kernels are as correlated as possible, we will be able to compress a lot the network. I'm not going to go into details, but um, this has been presented uh, in the past in, in a couple of, of works that you have here. Uh, very briefly, what we show here is that training on ImageNet, this gives you uh, very good results. And in terms of uh, compression, that also gives you very good results. One question that always comes to our mind is, do we really need these large networks? So interestingly, we show here that if you train from scratch the small network, you never get that um, strong performance. So it's good that you start with a big network, and during the training process, you try to learn which of the parameters are more relevant. So last but not least, in uh, two minutes, uh, 
um, what about the robustness of the network? So imagine that you have all this um, data from a single place, you have efficient networks. Now, what you really want is to be able to deploy this network wherever in the world, right? And in whatever situation that you have in mind. So common uh, ideal situation is you have training images and annotations from everywhere in the world. But what really happens is that um, you don't have that. You only have uh, source images with the annotations. We did some um, a quick approach where at this time you try to modify the distribution of the, of the images and try to bring them as close as possible to the training images. And with that, in real time, we managed to train a network with uh, data from Europe and deploy that all over Australia. And this was for semantic segmentation, um, and this was going quite well all over uh, different um, areas of Australia. And we, did, we didn't do any type of fine tuning. We just were changing the distribution of, of the images. This was interesting, but what usually happens is that you actually have target images of the, of the, uh, for, for training. You don't have the label, but you have the images. So what you can do is bring the images at train time as close as possible as those that you have for um, annotated, and then just increase your data set. At the team, we have been working on, on that particular idea, and in, uh, at CPR, we presented, or the team won the, uh, the challenge on domain adaptation by, instead of changing at this time the distribution of the images to be close as the, uh, the, as, as to the ones at the training, what we did is, at train time, we are going to bring those that we don't have annotated as close as possible to the ones that we have annotated and just train with all the images at the same time. This is nice and this got very good results, but what really happens is that we, you still have to collect data. And as uh, Javier was talk, talking before, what about the synthetic data? It would be very nice if you can actually exploit all the synthetic data that these days is, is, is available, right? The problem is that existing methods don't, don't manage this uh, that well. So very briefly, we have done a, um, at ECCV 2018, we presented a method we, where we only use synthetic data for training and we managed to um, do inference in any other um, domain, right? So our approach is very simple and is based on the intuition that different methods do, um, do, do perform differently depending on if it's a background class or a foreground class. So we realize that um, detection does, does a good job if you train a synthetic images uh, for detection and then you can do that on, um, on real images. And the idea is that a detection method should take care of the, of the shape. Whereas uh, for background classes, you have uh, segmentation networks that do well in capturing the texture and that texture can, can be transferred quite well to um, real images. So that's what we did. We just split the problem of semantic segmentation into different tasks. We consider background classes with a semantic segmentation approach, and we consider um, 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 and we consider uh, foreground classes with a detection approach. And at the end, at inference time, you just mix everything together. And, and you just run in uh, real images. With this simple approach, we managed to uh, outperform many other um, methods using only synthetic data or uh, pseudo labelings or other, other type of methods. And what happens also is that, as we said before, um, it's possible to collect data. You don't have annotations, but you can collect that data, right? So what happens if we try to fine tune all model with the data that we have um, already collected, that we don't have annotations. So what happens is that then um, we can still improve our performance and go from um, 38 in this case to 42% in, um, in, a, in a real um, um, data set of, of real images. Um, and this is another comparison with uh, some other type of weekly supervised methods. So very shortly, um, we are working on active learning. We show that we can train uh, probabilistic uh, ensembles to, uh, to, to understand the data that we have to label. We have 
been working on um, the way to understand and train the architecture. And last but not least, we have been working on domain adaptation and how can you train on synthetic data directly and then deploy it on, on, on real images. Um, and it, we show that it's possible to actually out, uh, outperform current existing methods only using synthetic data. And thank you.